subscribe to our YouTube channel, Joy Learning TV. Hello, learners. It's a pleasure to be with you on SHS on Joy Learning Channel. As usual, I am Adraina Abenyabua, your facilitator for government. Now, in some time past, for this particular lesson, we would concentrate on Form 3s. But then it will be an eye-opener for Form 1s and Form 2s to learn ahead of time. In some time past, we learned about some activities that existed or that happened before independence. And I know that everybody in Ghana knows when we had our independence, right? 6th of March, 1957. And when did we become a republic? That you should know as well, because it's a national holiday in Ghana. Very good. Before we had our independence, we would want to go back to colonization, where we said that a more powerful nation created dependencies on Africa, especially where our territories are, Gold Coast, and made us in such a way that um, took over our governance and all other issues that had to do with the Gold Coast. Very good. So to that extent, we would also want to go back to the struggle for independence. This had to do with some illustrious sons of the soil that fought so hard to move Africa and to that extent, or specifically, Gold Coast from colonialism. We will want to talk about these two or this particular event known as nationalism. Is that right? And they are of two factions. We will talk about the proto-nationalist activities or proto-nationalism that had to do with all nationalist activities or struggle for some sort of leverage with the government at that time, that is the British colonial government, as proto-nationalist groups or proto-nationalism. Is that okay? All they sought for was to be part of the administration of the colony. Then they went to the World War. And we call that the Second World War. This was a war fought between the Axis or some Axis groups in Europe. So we can talk about Germany, Italy, Japan, against Great Britain, US, and the Soviet Union. This was a war that had nothing to do with Africa. But at the time, which happened between 1939 to 1945, there was colonial rule in Africa. And we want to concentrate on our own territory, right? And so in the Gold Coast, there were colonial governments in place. And that gave them the advantage to employ or enlist Africans into their armies. And we went fighting with them. And when the war was over, we had to see another group of nationalism this time more militant and radical. They were no more interested in becoming part of the administration. In that time, we'll talk about the kinds of constitutions that were in place, the legislative councils and the executive councils. Africa was no longer interested, especially um, the Gold Coast, was no longer interested in just being part of the administration. They now wanted self-government. In their bid to get into self-government, we would talk about or would want to know and acknowledge the fact that to be able to get power legitimately, you must have a what? I want you to bring your minds here. To be able to get power legitimately and as governance or as a people, you must have a political party. So today we want to talk about the development of political parties and elections in the Gold Coast. Our emphasis is pre-independence political and constitutional development. I think I've made it clear here. Is that okay? Good. So we are going to talk about before independence, the political and constitutional developments that happened in the colony, Ashanti, Northern Territories, and Transvaal Tatugoland. This is what we call Ghana today. If you are in Form 3, this shouldn't be new to you. Even in Form 1, we did it in Class 6, all right, or in the basic school, and we're told that Ghana was colonized in four main forms. We can talk about the Gold Coast colony, or we say the initial Gold Coast colony, known as a colony. It was done through treaties or signing of agreements. Like the, the first one was the Bond of 1844. It was signed on the 6th of March, 1844. Then we talk about 
Ashanti by conquest, they went to war with the British on several occasions. And in 1900, they were colonized through um, being defeated at war, the Yasantwa War. Then we talk about the Northern Territories. And we say that these are territories that actually came to the British to be protected. So we call them the Northern Protectorates. Is that okay? They were um, persuaded by a man known as Ekem Ferguson from Winneba to go to the British for protection against warring tribes around them. Then we talk about Transbelt at Togoland that was given to the British and the French because originally it belonged to the Germans. Is that okay? And so they were given trans, a trans water to Goland was divided between the British and the French. And that part that is close to where we now, what is now called Volta region, all right, was given over to Ghana as trustee to take care of until the United Nations decided what to do with it. And then when Kwame Nkrumah, or Dr. Kwame Nkrumah became president, he gave it to them as a plebiscite to decide whether they wanted to be part or not. And they said they wanted to be part of Ghana. And so we want to talk about political parties as a bit by nationalist groups or as a bit of militant nationalism to cause the powers there be, that is the British colonial government, to grant independence to our territory now called Ghana. In the past, before independence, it was known as the Gold Coast, made up of the original colony, Ashanti, Northing, and Transvolta, Togoland. Is that okay? Now, before we move on, let us go back to what we would want to achieve today, that by the time our lesson is over, we should be able to identify five objectives of pre-independence political parties in the Gold Coast. Okay, we want to know what they sought to achieve. And then we would want to talk about, at least, if we had time, we would go through three major political parties established in that era and discuss one, their founders, venues and dates of establishment, their aims and objectives, their achievements, which are very paramount, challenges and failures, and some elections they contested that made them stand out amongst the others. To start with, we want to go back to Form 2. Form 3 is already here. Good. We want to go back to Form 2. I want to reorganize ourselves and come into remembrance what a political party is. So when we say a political party, we say it is an organized group of people with similar ideology who strive to capture political power through elections to, be administ to administer and control the affairs of the state. I guess that's why you, you remember very well that we would want to say that these are groups of people or an organized group of people, people who are well organized. They have a chairman, they have a vice chairman, they have um, general secretaries, they have um, organizers, they have treasurers, they have financial secretaries, and they have a group. These are a well organized group. And when we say well organized, it means that they have a ward, they, have, they, they work within the wards, they work within the uh, constituencies, they have um, regional representatives and regional groups, they have at the national level, they are well organized. And why are they organized? The main purpose is to capture what? Political power, because they have one ideology, one thing they cherish, one particular idea, all right, or vision they cherish. And we say that to capture political power through elections, they will be able to administer and control the affairs of the state. This is a political party. Now, if we are talking about pre-colonial times, sorry, pre-independence, which is colonial times, there was already an administration in place. That is the British colonial government. And when they had gone to war, I think we've talked about the war. After the Second World War, they had gone to Europe. Some of our soldiers have gone to Europe. Some men had gone to Europe to fight the war for um, Great Britain and the, uh, for France and the rest. And they had gone to Britain. Or they had, sorry, they had gone to fight for the British. And when they went to Europe to fight the war, they had seen things that they thought was not something that should be happening. Now, they had always seen the British as mystical, all right? They were people who couldn't die, people who, I mean, there are things they wouldn't do. But they had gone to war with them, and they had seen them die. You know when you, sh you, shoot, um, you shoot the gun, or the, the bullets come flying, and the bombs go flying? The whites, uh, the, the Europeans had also died. Apart from that, they had also seen them brutalizing their 
their counterparts as, 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 as Europeans. And so they, 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 saw as, they saw the African as a brute. But when they had gone to war, they had seen more bloodshed than they would see even in Africa. And so when they had come back, they had reorganized themselves. This time, they were not interested in becoming part of administration. They wanted to be the administration. So let's look at some objectives of pre-independence political parties in the Gold Coast. It was to accelerate constitutional reforms. Now, to be able to get to the point of taking over administration, constitutional reforms had to be done. Okay? Um, the constitutions in place did not give them the chance to maneuver their way around. Now, when we look at the, um, the first constitution, the Clifford's Constitution of 1916, we would want to look at the constituents of the Legislative Assembly and the what? And the Executive Assembly. It did not give the African the chance to hop onto the administration. Then we talk about Gorgeous Beck's Constitution of 1925. It looked a little better, but it still didn't give the African the chance to do better. Then they had gone to war and returned and had come to meet the Alamban's Constitution of 1946, right after the war. It was large in number, yes. A very large, um, a large, const it constituted a legislative assembly of 31 members. Okay, it was very big, but it still did not give the African the chance or the people of the Gold Coast, the elite of the Gold Coast, the chance to hop onto administration. And that was what they wanted. A faster rate at which constitutional reforms could be what could be done. Then it was also to introduce the universal adult suffrage. At that point in time, universal adult suffrage was pegged at 21 years. Okay, for the first time, Gorgesbeck's constitution allowed what we call the elective principle that allowed people to go to the post. But even that, there was a question mark to it. Who was qualified to vote? And if we looked at the constitution and the the, the, the kind of elections from the Joint Provincial Council and the rest, it did not give people so much advantage of, um, of exercising their franchise because of age. And that was another reason why these political parties were organized. It was also to identify and groom candidates for elections. Now, they believe that elections, the, 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 the call for elections and the organization of elections during that time will give them the chance to get a lot of their people or a lot of Africans into the executive and legislative councils, specifically the legislative councils. And so that is what they wanted. They began, they created the political parties to groom candidates, which is one of the focal reasons why political parties are created. So they chose people and they would groom them over time to be able to stand for elections. And when they are able to get them to what or where they want, they will be able to gain some of the advantages they've been seeking for. Another reason why these pre-colonial, pre-independence political parties were formed was to fight for self-rule. It took time, but then one, that was one of their major objectives, to fight for independence, to be able to take over administration of their own soil, of their own lands from the colonial administration. And that was another feature. Now, another objective of the pre-independence political party was to fight for economic and social reforms. Now, around 1945, when the war had been fought and people had returned back to their homes, back to normal, things had, no, had, things had changed drastically in the colonies. Now, one of the issues is the overtaking of businesses from the Africans. The unfair colonial policies that had to do with economic um, activities where Foreigners had an upper hand over the African. Foreigners could have, they, they, they were not controlled. They could, they could build businesses of any kind within the colonies, especially the Lebanosians. These were um, expatriates who had come into the Gold Coast to do business. And putting them side by side, the African, it felt as if the African was being cheated. And then there were social reforms where we talk about discrimination in some parts of the world with regards to some parts of Africa, especially in the Gold Coast, with regards to health services, with regards to um, schools and educational institutions. There were a lot of biases. And so that was the reason why these political parties began to emerge pre-independence pre time or colonial times. It was also to enhance greater political 
participation. Because of the intimidations within the colony, it became impossible for people to rise up and speak their minds, express their opinion, to be able to tell how they felt with regards to the political environment at that time. And so with the creation of political parties, it gave people the advantage to speak their minds, be part of political activities, and participate actively in politics in the colony. It was also to end the domination of the chiefs. You remember the chiefs when we talked about pre-colonial times, before colonization, and within colonization. During colonization, all right, the, especially with the indirect rule, and uh, we talk about the crown colony system. The chiefs were the dominant um, administrators when it comes to grassroots participation or grassroots governance. It was the chief that were used to do everything the British wanted. And because of that, they became corrupt. They became autocratic. And so uh, they also created a fashion between the people and the colonial administration. Uh, it, it, there was a lot of chaos with regards to the chiefs. And so when political parties are in place, there is no place for the chief. And for the educated elites, they expected that when chiefs were el eliminated, they would have a better chance because they have studied what, or they had what it took to control governance. And that was one of the other things. And also the last one is to end all iniquities. Colonization was an evil. All right, it was an evil that had to be eradicated. And it came with a lot of problems, all right? Racial discrimination, um, do, uh, discrimination in every form. It also had to do with the people being intimidated and the rest. And so when political parties are there, it would give them the chance to end all iniquities. Very good. So then in 1945 or in 1946, when the Alambans constitution had been created, um, along the line, the first political party was introduced. I guess that we've heard about the UGCC for a very long time, all right, right down from primary school. So today I want to do a little in-depth knowledge about the first, or what we call the premier political party in the Gold Coast. So we talk about the United Gold Coast Convention. Put that one in your head, eh? United Gold Coast Convention. It is... And with the abbreviation UGCC, it was formed on the 4th of August, 1947. So we see right after the Alambans Constitution of 1946, on the 4th of August, the UGCC was formed. It was formed in Salt Pond. How many of you know Salt Pond? Yes, for those people, or for those students who are in Infantiman, Infantipem, Agri Memorial, yes. Yes, you, you know that route. But those of us in Accra, it is in the central region very good, by the coast or at the coastal region. It was formed from two vibrant political movements in the Gold Coast known as the Gold Coast People's League and the Gold Coast National Party. These were political movements. They were not political parties. They were groups that had formed to fight um, for some form of liberation from them or to agitate for some sort of self-rule. Now, the leadership of the UGCC took that opportunity to put the two groups together to become UGCC, becoming the first political party in the Gold Coast in 1947. So this is how their, their flag looks like, all right? So you can see the GC, I think the UG didn't come too well, all right? So UGCC, and this is the flag of the UGCC, United Gold Coast Convention. Now, let's look at the executive at that time. As in 1946, we can talk about George Grant, popularly known as Pa Grant. We talk about Joseph Wachi Dankwa. Then we can talk about R.S. Blay as vice chairman, all right? Then we have Kwame Nkrumah as the general secretary. Initially, when it was formed, Kwame Nkrumah wasn't there. Is that okay? He joined in 19, sometime later, when Akweje told the group, that there was an illustrious man and one of our hard-working um, Pan-Africanists. And so when we talk about Pan-Africanists, we are talking about some sort of brotherhood that align themselves together with issues of Africa. They could be in or outside Africa. Some of them, like Marcus Garvey, uh, George Padmore, and the rest, these were Pan-Africanists. They, they are also part of the nationalist um, desire to free Africa from 
colonial rule or imperialism. And to that extent, Kwame Nkrumah was with, you remember when we were doing proto nationalist group? Yes, we talked about WASU, West Africa Students Union. Where was it situated? Very good. So it was not in Africa. It was in, very good. Now Kwame Nkrumah was, was a student at that time, and so he was part of WASU. All right, so he had gone to lodge in one of the, uh, how do you call it, hostels, all right, created by Marcus Gavi. And so when the group was formed, Akweje would, um, gave a testimony about uh, another man that was good at organizing people, had the flair for um, putting things together and getting the desired results. And so in 1947, he, he replied that he was ready to come. And so he was sent a hundred pounds, all right, as his ship fare to come down to join the group. And so in 1947, he also came as, and he became the general secretary of the entire party. Then we have the treasurer as RAA Awuno. Among, or uh, aside these, there were other leading members. These were also part of the group. They were vibrant. And we talk about E. Akufuado, we talk about Obechebi Lamte. You remember Obechebi Lamte? Yes, his son was also a member, a, a politician, very good. We have J.W. D. Graft Johnson, E. W. E. Oforiata, Akweje, Kobna Kesi, and John Sibyl. This man had um, a newspaper to his, his, his credit. Now these men were businessmen, they were lawyers, some of them were teachers. So these were what we call the educated elite, or we can call them the elite of society. We talk about power grants as a timber, um, timber um, contractor. He was a, a rich man at that time. And when we talk about somebody who is an elite, or when we talk about the elite, we say people who see themselves as highly superior than others. At that point in time, they were very rich men. Apart from that, some of them were lawyers. That gave them the advantage of becoming elite through education. All right? And they put the United Gold Coast Convention together. And it had its headquarters at Salt Pond. Is that okay? Now let's look at their aims. One of their aims is that the party aimed at achieving constitutional advancement for the Gold Coast through gradual processes. The party aimed at achieving constitutional advancement for the Gold Coast through gradual processes. They preferred constitutional measures. And with that sense, it said that they did not really want, they wanted years, they wanted self rule they also um, desired independence. But for them, they said that it should be a gradual process. Now, the, the administrators of the colony had taken over for a very long time, through uh, 1844, even beyond that. And to take over administration, it must be a gradual process. We take a step at a time. Okay, so that was one of their aims, that they were going to use the due process of the system to get to um, independence. The party aimed at achieving self-government for the Gold Coast by legal and constitutional means, and finally independence at the shortest possible time. Now, when we say shortest possible time, it can be today, it can be tomorrow, it can be 10 years from now, it is also the shortest possible time. And so for them, they hoped to achieve or they hoped to gain or attain independence. But when was a problem? When were they going to get independence? Was it tomorrow? Was it about two months from the time when the group was formed? Because the people were suffering at the hands of the British. And so they, 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 their agitation was to gain freedom from colonialism. And then that is what the UGCC could offer the people. Another aim was the party sought to ensure that persons who were selected to represent the people in the Legislative Assembly were selected on the basis of competencies by merit. Is that okay? So then people who were selected to become legislators, whether official or unofficial, for example, when, you, when we look at the Alambans Constitution, we are talking about 31 members in the Legislative Assembly. And we will talk about the fact that a few are official, okay, six are official. Now when we talk about the legislative councils in colonial times, and we talk about the official and unofficial members, the official members had voting rights. So even if it is one person and the rest are all there, 
they can deliberate, they would make noise, and they will parley, all right, Jojo. But at the end of the day, it is the six who make um, constructive decisions. And so we had about 25 unofficial members. Now with these unofficial members, we can, with Alamban's constitution, which I can talk about, nine of them from the Joint Provincial Council. Now under the Gorgisbeck's constitution, Gorgisbeck created what we call the Provincial Councils. These were groups of chiefs at local levels. We talk about the Eastern Province, the Central Province, and the Western Province, okay? And so nine of them would come from there. These are chiefs. Okay, then we can talk about four from Asante Man Council. This is also a group of chiefs within the Asante Kingdom. Okay, and then we can talk about five from Accra, Cape Coast, Sekendi, Itakrade, Kumasi, and the rest. And this is through Universal Adult Savage or through um, franchise, through the issue of, of the polls. How many people would have the chance to get it? So for them, one of their aims is to make sure that anybody who was selected into the Legislative Council was there through the fact that the person had the competency, had the experience, had the qualification to be there. And not because in the past, because he deemed it to be there. You were a friend to the governor, the governor could manipulate you, no. You had to work through it. You, for them, they were educated elites. And so to be there, it meant that you are educated. You can know your ins and outs in the making of legislation. Then the party sought to oppose the ban's constitution of 1944 that on the over-reliance on the chiefs in the Legislative Council. Now, at a point in time, the chiefs were extremely powerful, all right, within the colony. And so even with the Legislative Assembly, you realize that the chiefs are more, nine of them. And then when you go to the Executive Councils, in, uh, in, in one of the constitutions of Gorges, I think in the Gorgesbeck's constitution, um, they have the advantage of having two chiefs there. Nana Akukosa and uh, uh, Nana Tseboda uh, right? Good. Now, at a point in time, you realize that it is the chief that dominated both the, the, especially with the Legislative Council, when it comes to the local people. And so they, what they sought to do was to oppose the land's uh, ban's constitution to be re, or to be amended or to be rewritten or to be redrafted so that the chiefs could be pulled out of the Legislative Council and allow the educated elites to sit in that bus to be able to make meaningful legislation. So the UGCC had some successes. Let's see what they were. Now, they became the pay setters for the formation of all political parties in Gold Coast. Frank B, so it's the truth, and there's nothing we can do about it, that the UGCC was the first political party officially accepted in the Gold Coast by the colonial government. At that point in time, they became the forefronters. After them, other political parties looked up to them to form. Even though they were, um, at a point in time, they died off, the UGCC became the first political party to be formed in the Gold Coast, to become some sort of model for other political parties to be formed. Another one of their successes is that five of its leading members without Dr. Kwame Nkrumah were called to serve on the COSI committee and in the drafting of the 1951 constitution after the 1948 riots. You remember the 1948 riots? What happened? Yes. Good. So before that, there were problems in the colony. Okay. But the immediate problem that created the riots happened on the 28th February, 28th February of 19, yes, 1948, at the crossroads between uh, the Osu Township somehow and the path leading to, or the road leading to the castle. Now, the basic issue was this. Men had gone to war, veterans, we call them veterans. They, are, they have been pensioned. Now, when an, a, a soldier is pensioned, he becomes a veteran, okay? So they had been pensioned. After they had come from the war, all they were seeking for was to be paid their pension entitlement. Okay, they were supposed to be given their entitlement of the war. Now, when they were going to war, they were promised a good job, some some sort of advantages over uh, the people who were already here because they had gone to fight with their blood. Some of them had died. Some of them had come maimed. When we say somebody is maimed, parts of their limbs have been cut off, blown off by um, bombs and the rest. 
Some of them, their bodies had been, and, and a whole lot of things. Some of them had lost their eye and other senses. And when they had come back, they had been neglected, put somewhere, forgotten. But when they were going, they had been given a lot of promises. All they wanted was their entitlement. Then they had woken up one morning, and they had a secretary called Mr. B.F. Tamaklu. So they had woken up one morning with a proud notice to the British government and said they were going to see the governor at the time. All right, so what they wanted to tell the governor is like, we are still here. We want our entitlement. So they had marched beautifully. You can just see all soldiers at, at, at a march. And as they moved on, they had moved towards the castle road. One fine morning. And then, for those of you who had come for excursions in Accra, you see that there's a Kwame Kuma mausoleum. After that, you can come and see the Flagstar Square. Right after the Fla Flagstar Square, there is a, a road that leads to the castle. All right, one comes from the, the Accra Township and then to the Christian Box Castle. So as they moved on, you know, soldiers, they'll be singing war songs and the rest. When they had gotten to the crossroad, there was the colonial police there said they should stop. And they had insisted that they wanted to see the governor. And so um, police superintendent Imri, C.H. Imri, had commanded that um, fire be opened. On that fateful light, on that fateful morning, three of these gallant soldiers that had fought for the British, Sergeant Ajete, Corporal Atipo, and Private Odati Lamte, had lost their lives. So sad, right? Apart from that, some of their soldiers had also gotten hit because these were bullets being fired or there were rifles being fired with live bullets. And so that had sparked a lot of anger in the people. On that day, there was widespread riots. People had bent down people's shops, you know, Accra Central. It's close to Accra Central. So people had taken the advantage to loot goods, had bent down shops, had destroyed property. And in that event, um, the big six had been arrested. When they were released, five of them were invited to come to what we call, the first one was the Watson Committee. The Watson Committee was by, um, I think, Andrews Watson, all right? And he had sat down to look at some of the causes that had caused the riots. Some of them were political, some of them were social, some of them were economic. There was a lot of issues in the Gold Coast or in the colony at that time. Then right after that, the governor at the time had invited um, uh, Sir Corsi, or what we say, he is called Justice Henley Corsi. He was um, a justice of the law court. He was invited to create what we call the Corsi Committee, or a committee, a commission, or a committee. All right, the committee sought to sit and look at some of the recommendations of the Watson Commission and see what can be done. In that event, five of the big six had been invited without Dr. Kwame Nkrumah. All right. It is one of another bone of contention here. And so they had been invited to sit and draft the 1951 Adding Clark's Constitution, or would say the Nkrumah Constitution. Another one of their achievements is the use of nonviolent means to demand for constitutional and political reforms in the Gold Coast. For them, they prefer to use nonviolent means, the use of the press, um, debates, um, dialogue. With, with reference to constitutional and political reforms, they did not like or they were not interested in violence. The good thing is with this group was that they were well to do, they were well educated. And so for them, they preferred not to use violence. Because if you have what to eat, yet you are agitating for other people who had nothing to eat, you don't use violence. You, you don't, you don't, excuse, I would say they don't, I wouldn't say they do, they didn't feel how the law in society felt. But these were from the upper, upper class, or sorry, the upper class of society. So um, they prefer to use uh, the normal constitutional means, all right? Something more subtle, something more calm than violence. And at a point in time, we say they succeeded. The party's leadership, particularly um, Joseph Bwachidankwa is credited with recommending the name Ghana to be adopted by the country after independence. According to Edu Bwahen, during some of their meetings, um, J.B. Dankwa had come out with the name Ghana to be replaced after independence, okay? So that Gold Coast wouldn't remind the people of the suffering 
and the pain they had gone through in their hands and the discrimination they had gone through at the hands of the British. And so for him, he had earlier on recommended the name Ghana, looking at how prosperous the old Ghana Empire. Yes, when you were in JHS, you were told about the old Ghana Empire, right? Good. And so how prosperous they had been. That was, so we can credit the name Ghana somehow to J.B. Dankwa. Another one is that the paper established, sorry, the party established its own newspaper. The party established its own newspaper called the Talking Drum to help educate the people on the evils of colonialism and on their rights. So the party, yes, they, they, they have the means to do it. They, they established the Talking Drum, which was a newspaper within the colony. And this paper sought to educate the people upon their rights or on their rights, as well as some of the evils of colonialism, the things that did not make colonial rule so attractive because in a way it discriminated greatly against the Africans. Very good. Now we also want to talk about some other achievement. It also established branches in the southern sector of the Gold Coast, Ashanti and Northern Territories and gave political education to its members. When Dr. Kwame Nkrumah came into the Gold Coast from um, his studies abroad, he, after he had been brought in to join the leadership of the UGCC, he began to establish, he, had, he began to establish um, groups, or we can call them branches all over the state, or all over the colony. Because political parties, if it was going to be that effective, must have branches all over. So he even had the advantage of creating a very vibrant youth group called the CYU, all right, Committee on Youth Organization, as far as to Takwa. And the youth were all over. They wanted to be part. But remember that one of the problems of the UGCC was that it was an elite group. So he did not want the pinching, pinching, giddy, giddy of the young people. And so we say that, as a, as a matter of fact, they were able to open some branches all over the colony. The party created a platform for the educated elites and the nationalists to join forces to fight against colonialism. And so there were some nationalists who were also Pan-Africanist in nature. And then there were um, the educated elites that had been ignored with regards to the indirect rule. Now, the political party now being formed gave the platform for both the educated elites and some nationalists or persons who were so much, that had a desire to fight for the freedom of the African to get the same platform so that within that sector, they'll be able to fight and gain independence. But they had challenges. The UGCC had a lot of challenges. <laughs> Among them was that the party was elitist in outlook. They were of an elite, it was an elite party. Now we know the difference between a mass party and an elite party. We are talking about a group that is not too wide, does not like violence, and is, it is made up of the elites in society. And it becomes very impossible for them to come to levels with the ordinary people. Now, when we look at the leadership of the UGCC, some of them were chiefs, or some of them came from royal families, or they had a royal blood in them. And so it made it, you, you know how some of our, most of our chiefs, especially in Africa, are, it makes it impossible for them to flow with their local people. And so it made it, they were conservatives. This is how it should be done. Without this, it cannot be done in any way. And so it became an impediment in the success of the group. The party became unattractive when it failed to achieve self-government for the people of the Gold Coast. Now, for, for most of these educated elites, as well as the people of the Gold Coast, to, to create such a very beautiful and big party was to make sure that at the end of the day, we're gaining self-government. We wanted independence at all price. We can't go to war and see the, the powers that rule us looking just like us and allowing them to rule. So we wanted our sort of independence. And then they were not so interested. They the shortest possible time. When is the shortest possible time? So that alone made the party unattractive. And then it began to go down. People began to look for other places that could give them what they wanted. The party lacked national appeal since it was urban-based. You would only find their offices 
and some parts of the activities only in the urban areas. Now to the local, or we call them the rural areas or the hinterlands, were at a disadvantage. As a matter of fact, they didn't even know that there was a group called UGCC. It was only known in Cape Coast, in Salpone, some parts of Accra, um, some parts of the Western region. People didn't even know what the UGCC was all about, especially those in the hinterlands. They had no idea. And so because of that, it lacked national appeal. To be able to get people in the same boat, you must be able to reach everybody to get the support you needed. And the UGCC, they could not do that. It also lacked full-time politicians committed to the cause since leadership was made up of businessmen and professionals. Now, these are people who do not have time. Somebody is chasing his timber consignment. People have issues to deal with at their courts, lawyers, a teacher is in school. You see, when it comes to politics or when it comes to political parties, people are full-time politicians. You will sit and make sure that the party is working according to plan. And so when they didn't get full-time politicians, and because attentions were divided, it also brought down the downfall of the UGCC. The other one was that the party could not reconcile with Nkrumah's radical strategies, ideology and timing for independence, and eventually his break off from the party. Very good. The party, as leadership, could not come to terms with Kwame Nkrumah because his, it was more of power struggle, okay? So to an extent, it felt as if Kwame Nkrumah was too giddy giddy, eh? He was too radical. He wanted, he, he wanted to use all means available to get the people what they wanted. And UGCC leadership was not in favor of that. Now his ideologies were different. Even though he was a Pan-Africanist, he was part of the nationalist struggle, his ideology and his timing for independence was, he wanted independence now, no, 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 no. We are here, let us fight for it, we can do it. Now the leadership, because they were affluent in society, said, oh, in the shortest possible time, let us take our time, let's go through the gradual process of getting independence. And then eventually he had to break off and that also brought down the UGCC. They went for elections for the first time in a massive form in 1951, uh, based on the Corsi Committee, okay? And in 1951, out of 38 seats, UGCC won only two. Remember that it was only the Legislative Council that permitted elected members, that is parliamentary elections, and UGCC got only two. And that was a downfall of the party where people began to move of very good. So let's see why Kwame Nkrumah broke away from, why did Kwame Nkrumah break away from the UGCC? After all, they brought him into the system, isn't it? Very good. One of them was his ideological factors. Seriously, he, his, his, form, his form of thinking and the ideology he, he, he was expressing were different, all right? His way of thinking and the thinking of the UGCC members were different, especially with leadership. And so that caused a lot of problems and conflicts within the party, and it was good that he broke away. Then conflicts over methods and means in demanding independence. Now when we go forward a bit, we'll see CPP, all right? And they said positive, yes, positive action. Now they would use all sort of means, especially when it, 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 even though it is constitutional, it's a little harsh, like strikes, boycott, civil disobedience, um, and all that. They, they, were, they wanted everything that was radical in nature to be able to get the British to give them independence. And so his methods, his, there were a lot of methods, even with the forming of the CYU. Leadership of um, UGCC said no. All right, he wasn't supposed to bring in um, those radical, those um, harsh gentlemen and youth into the party. And that was his form of idea when it comes to getting independence. Personality and power struggle. Naturally, he's a charismatic leader. When he takes over, his charisma alone gets people to him. And in the party, he could use his initiative without the... Um, without the 
permission or without the mandate of the others to create things for the party that are under UGCC. And that also was a problem because they felt that he was competing with the leaders. And that also caused this breakaway. Then the timing of independence. UGCC says in the short, independence in the shortest possible time. And Kwame Nkrumah says independence now. The timing were different. And so that also caused the break away. Then the attitude of the leadership of UGCC towards the 1948 trial. Let me take this again. Another reason why Kwame Nkrumah broke off was the attitude of the leadership of the UGCC towards the 1948 trial. In 1948, when the riot had taken place, the unrest had taken place, the British began to look for people to blame. And so they arrested Kwame Nkrumah and the Big Six, all leadership of the UGCC. They were put into custody or they were imprisoned for eight weeks, all right? The UGCC, including Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, were put into prison or detention for eight weeks. Then after eight weeks, they were released. When they were released, the leadership of the UGCC, without Dr. Kwame Nkrumah said, they did not support what the people did. That no matter what, whether people had been killed or not, no, they shouldn't have gone out on the route. And Kwame Nkrumah says, I take full action for what our people did. They had every right to do it. Because if you looked at the economic causes, look at political causes, you look at discrimination, you look at everything that was happening in the Gold Coast at that time, the people had every right to, be, to cause an unrest. And so he took over the responsibility. And that was something Kwame Nkrumah didn't understand as to why we want something and our people had caused mayhem. Yes, it wasn't right, but this is what has happened. Why don't we take advantage of it? And so that is it. And then another thing that happened was that Kwame Nkrumah's exclusion from the Kosi Committee, it, I think it actually angered him. That he being an intellectual, all others, businessmen and lawyers, were invited to be part of the Corsair Committee. The five were invited. And then he was excluded. All right? He was asked not to be part. He didn't get an invitation to be there. All he knew was that they were part of the Corsair Committee. And it also caused a lot of hurt with him. And then he had to stay off. Then the other thing was the suspension. When the party had come back, when leadership had been released, Kwame Nkrumah was suspended. All right? He was suspended, and then he was made a treasurer. So the general secretary um, position was taken from him. Now, in most political parties, the general secretaries are the stronger. Even the chairman can be there, but the general secretaries are the hear and says of the party. They speak and things work. They put their party together. And so Kwame Nkrumah was suspended from the party, and when he came back, he was given treasurer. You can just imagine how hurt you would be putting a party together. And then when you come back from suspension, you are a treasurer. What would he do with the treasurer? Good. So he moved. So that on the 12th of June, 1949, he took advantage of the break off. And then at Arena on the 12th of June, 1949, he put the CYO together. It was a large group of youth. They were the youth of the Gold Coast, and they were very, they were, they were a mass. And at Arena, they established the Convention's People's Party, the Convention People's Party, now known as CPP, okay, with that abbreviation CPP, Convention People's Party. It was formed on the 12th of June, 1949, at Arena, in Accra. How many of you know Arena? Those in Accra, yes. When you are going to Abu Gloshi, eh? Yes, the suburb of Accra. It's a, market, it's a marketing center, and eh, good, or full stars. You would meet Arena before you get to Agublushi. And so their motto was forward ever, backwards never. And it was formed with the UCYO. And this is their party. I guess they are still, in, still here. And so this is their party colors or party flag. The CPP was formed by Dr. Kwame Nkrumah. Vice chairman was K.A. Gbedema. 
Secretary was Kojobo Otsio and Financial Secretary was AYK Jin. Other leading members were Klobo Edusei, Jen Kledewu, Kofi Baako, Ashe Kote and Kwesi Planch. These were the leading members. Let's see some of their aims. One of their aim was to fight relentlessly by all constitutional means for the achievement of self-government for the people and the chiefs of the Gold Coast. All constitutional means. Boycotts are constitutional means. Strikes are constitutional means. Demonstrations are constitutional means. Dialogue are constitutional means. Lobbying is a constitutional means. So all of them was to be employed to be able to get the people of the Gold Coast um, independence to lead a crusade for the abolition of all forms of political oppression and the establishment of desirable democratic institutions. Now, another aim was to work for a better reconstruction of a better Ghana or a better Gold Coast in which the people have the right to live and govern themselves as a free people. And so one aim was to make sure that the Gold Coast was reconstructed so that the people would be able to govern themselves and not by a foreign rule to achieve and maintain a perfect unity among the chiefs and the people of the colony ashanti northern territories and transwater togoland or transvolta so the cpp had the aim of putting all works of people under or within the territories of what we now see as ghana together so that these people with their chiefs and people would live together to work in the interest of trade union movements in the country for better conditions of service. Remember the issue of employment. All right, people were all over the Gold Coast, they were not employed. Secondly, there were businesses that were not doing well because of foreign firms. And so that was another one of their aims. Another of their aims was to assist and facilitate in any way possible the realization of a united and self-governing West Africa. Then another aim of the CPP was to work with other nationalists in Africa and other continents to abolish imperialism. It's a, it's a form of colonialism, right? Colonialism and all forms of racism, all right? Racism, where people see their races as more superior than other races and would want to discriminate against them and all in the attainment of world peace. To work and support Pan-Africanism by promoting the unity of Africa and of African descent. So anybody who was not in the Gold Coast, anybody who is, the, who is an African but not in Africa, it could be African Americans, African Jamaicans and whatever. Once they can trace their roots into Africa, it was to support them to be part of Africa. Now let's look at some successes of the CPP. <laughs> the first one is that the party opened branches all over the country and held rallies to educate the people, which was new for the first time in the Gold Coast. Even though UGCC was the first party, it was a CPP that opened, became a, a, an opener for the people of the Gold Coast all over the country. Where in the hinterlands, Dr. Kwame, under the, under the leadership of Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, sent this, the CPP to all these areas to be able to rally the people, to get their support towards independence. The party utilized, actively utilized the print media, particularly the evening news, to arouse and promote national consciousness in the people. And so another achievement was that they used the media, all right, and for them they had what we call the evening news, to help the people to know political issues within the domains of the Gold Coast. The CPP used radical means such as strikes, boycotts, demonstrations, civil disobedience to force the British colonial government to grant constitutional changes to the gold coast. Then another one of the achievements was that it became a mass political party made up of people from all walks of life in the state. So when you came into the CPP, you could find everybody there. Lawyers, teachers, shoemakers, um, traders, and what have you. You could find Ashantis, you could find um, Gans, Guans, Northness, everybody was there. You could find a whole host of people and it became a mass party. Now, its slogan, self-government now, was more appealing, isn't it? And radical methods like positive action helped to quicken the pace and attainment of independence eventually in 1957. Its slogan, self-government now, and radical methods like positive action 
help to quicken the pace and attainment of independence eventually in 1957. So it was more appealing than the shortest possible time. So people began to flop into or began to move into the CPP. And it quickened the attainment, especially with a positive action where all actions, all right, could be employed to get the British colonial rule to give the Gold Coast independence. The CPP from 1951 to 1956 won all elections organized before independence in the country. All right. So when we talk about the 1951, they, we had three elections there, 1951, 1954, and 1956. Now in 1951, um, in 1950, Kwame Nkrumah had been, I think in 1951, Kwame Nkrumah had been imprisoned with all his executives. All right, because I think something had happened. And when they were imprisoned, when they had been imprisoned, um, it became a problem. And so that was at that time when the Adin Clark's constitution was written. When it was written, it mandated that the people go to the polls in 1951. While in prison, the people voted and he won massively. And so it caused the government at that time or the governor at that time, to release Dr. Kwame Nkrumah because he had won massively. The CPP, under the leadership of Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, helped Ghana attain Republican status as a fully independent state in 1960. And so um, we received the royal assent in February 1957, all right, that we could, in a way, become... They, he petitioned to the British governor, and then in some time past... Uh, some time to come, he was given the asset that the system will become fully a Republican state where the people will be able to vote for their own leaders and to be able to make their decisions without outside interference. Another success was that the CPP under Dr. Kwame Nkrumah undertook massive constructional development in the state. Notably among them are the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology, NUST, eh? It is still there, very active. It was Dr. Kwame Nkrumah that built the, the initial part of the university. Now we talk about Tema Township, all right? The entire township was created by Dr. Kwame Nkrumah as an industrial city of Ghana where we could find all industries. And well, some of these industries had gone off, but some of, some of them are still there, sorry. Now we, have, we can talk about the Akosombo Dam, all right? Though some of the turbines are down, we still access electricity from the dam. Then we see the Adomi Bridge. How many of you have seen the Adomi Bridge? Good. So you go and look for the Adomi Bridge. And it is also a very beautiful edifice of a bridge. And then we talk about some estate housing projects throughout Ghana, among others. A lot of housing projects were undertaken by Dr. Kwame Nkrumah. Then the party helped to promote pan-Africanism. That some Africanist movements were allowed within the party to help in getting the party to get to where it is. Now, the CPP, all right, also had challenges. At a point in time, they became dictatorial and suppressed the opposition after independence using the Prevention Detention Act of 1958. Now, when we had gained independence in 1957, we were still being detected to by the colonial government. But at that time, because of the successes of the elections, CPP had... They were the majority in parliament because they had 30, I think they had 34, 32 votes. Good. Out of the 38 seats, they had won 38, 32 seats. And so when they had gone into parliament, they had chosen Kwame Nkrumah as the head of government business. Automatically, he becomes a prime minister in 19, and so in 1952, he was made the prime minister of the Gold Coast. And then in 1956, when the assent had been given for independence, he became the, also the prime minister at that time. Very good. Then in 1958, he instituted the Preventive Detention Act. And it was to detain people who he called opposition to progress. He had detained J.B. Dankwa, R.R. and Ponsa and the rest with this particular act. And that is why we say that he be, the party became more of an, um, a dictatorial party. The CPP turned Ghana into a de jure one-party state in 1960. Now, I think that those of us in Form 3 know the differences between 
um, the party system. So we, we talk about types of, yes, party system. We have the one party system, we have the two party system, and the multi party system. And so for democracy, for democracy to work better, we prefer the multi party system. And so he, Ghana was turned into a de jure one party system in 1960, where the CPP was the only party. When we say the jury, understand by the law, by law, it was the only it was only the CPP that was allowed to operate as a political party. There was nepotism, economic mismanagement, widespread corruption and bribery in government. So when the CPP had won elections and had been given the mandate to rule, it became something else. They became very corrupt. It was more of family and friends. There was economic mismanagement and bribery all over in government. Then the CPP and Dr. Kwame Nkrumah enforced Article 55 of the 1960 Constitution that allowed the president the power to appoint and dismiss judges of the law court under normal circumstances. It is the judges that are appointed cannot be dismissed, right? But then under this particular act, if a judge was not working up to the details of the government, it could be dismissed and a new one appointed. So let's look at elections of the CPP. In 1951, they went to elections with UGCC, uh -huh, a lot of them, very good. And out of these two parties that had gone to the party were the dominant parties, UGCC and CPP. At the end of the elections, CPP had won 34 seats out of the 38 seats. And two seats were, were taken over by some other parties and two were given to the UGCC. So in parliament, or in the Legislative Assembly, or in the National Assembly, there were 34 CPP parliamentary seats. And that gave them the advantage to choose Dr. Kwame Nkrumah as head of government business, or the majority um, leader. And that automatically he becomes the prime minister. Then in 1954, there were 71 parliamentary seats, one out of 102, 104 seats. Let me take this again. In 1954, out of 104 seats, CPP had won 71 parliamentary seats. Then in 1956, CPP again, during a massive election, had won 72 parliamentary seats out of 104 seats, making it the majority in the Legislative Assembly or in the National Assembly. And it is worth noting that in all this, they still voted Dr. Kwame Nkrumah as the head of government business. So then I'm going to give you a reading assignment. We've talked about UGCC. We've talked about their, their dates of establishment or dates of formation. We talked about places where the party started from. We've talked about some leading members within the party. We've talked about their achievements, some of their failures. Now you would also at home would go and read about the National Liberation Movement, known as the NLM. It was also a pre-independence party that was formed. And the United Party that was formed from UGCC. All right? And you are also going to take your time and go through it as a reading assignment. But then this is what I have for you on the topic. You are going to look for five factors that contributed to the formation of political parties after the Second World War. This is a major WASI question. All right? So you are going to... Look for five factors, and if you can get more, it's a plus, right? You are going to look for five factors that contributed to the formation of political parties after the Second World War. So you write the question down as it is displayed on the screen. What five factors contributed to the formation of political parties after the Second World War? I hope you've been able to get the question right. Good. So when it comes to the reading assignment, you're going to read about the NLM and the UP, the United Party of the Gold Coast. All right. In a bit to get information to do our work today, and these are some of the references you can also depend on. Very good. I hope you are looking at them. Very good. So today we've gone through some interesting facts about colonialism. To be frank, we learned this not because of, not all the time about exams, but we'd also want to know where we have come from. 
and where we are today, to be able to appreciate the efforts made by the people who liberated our territories to be what it is today for us to enjoy so much rights. It is good to know where you come from, isn't it? And so as part of our bit to know where we come from, this is also part of a history of the Gold Coast. And so you were talking about, we've spoken about some political parties that were formed before independence, before or in colonial times. We've discussed the UGCC, which is something we all know, but we're going through again. And we've talked about the CPP. I've also given you a reading assignment on NLM and the United Party. All too soon, we have come to the end of today's lesson. We'll come your way again with other lessons related to um, independence and post-independence, constitutional and political um, development. But until we meet again, it's goodbye for now. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, Joy Learning TV.